So I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Evans to the podium. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. And while Abdul helps me load these slides, um, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, has anybody sort of thought about cannabis as a medicine for schizophrenia? Yes, I have. Yeah. Yeah, I think that there's a, a lot of hope out there um, that, uh, that uh, uh, for many diseases, many problems for which we don't have effective treatments, uh, that marijuana will be an answer. Um, and, and schizophrenia is, 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 is not uh, alone there. Um, I'm going to plug in my computer also, one second. Um, so what do we know about, about schizophrenia and cannabis use? What do we know about, about the association? Um, I'm going to build a little bit on Josh's fabulous talk because cannabis use is one of those uh, 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 um, factors that's an environmental exposure, right? So folate is an environmental exposure when it, you know, in utero and if you take medicines through your adolescence. Cannabis use is also an environmental exposure, right, if you will, um, that may change the risk of schizophrenia. Um, slides are not showing up so well. So, um, so essentially, um, this is not so pretty, but at least you can see what's on the slide. I apologize. I, he didn't want to load them for security reasons. So, um, you know, we have to be secure. Um, let's see. So sorry about that. So we'll just go with this for now. Okay, so, so, so a lot of people have thought about this. Uh, cannabis has two main ingredients. One is THC, and that's what gets you high, essentially. And the other is CBD, or cannabidiol, which has been tried without a whole lot of success, but it's been tried for, um, for, as a treatment for schizophrenia. Uh, it may have some effects on anxiety, on inflammation, and possibly on psychosis, although the early trials weren't particularly promising. But, but I want to talk about sort of three levels of, of uh, because uh, it's very interesting to talk about risk factors for developing schizophrenia, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But I wanted to focus really on what, what's, the, what's the risk of cannabis use for people who already have schizophrenia. So we know lots of people uh, who, 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 and, and, and who may want to try cannabis, uh, and, and we need to understand that, the effects of that. And so, um, so we do know... Which one is the we do know that, that cannabis use in and of itself exacerbates symptoms of psychosis. Not only does it exacerbate symptoms of psychosis, it exacerbates the course of psychosis, the long-term course of psychosis. We know that cannabis use, well, there's strong support for that. We, there's really very good support internationally with big studies over 30 years that cannabis use in youth, so, so in people you know, 15 to 20, if you, if you will, may precipitate schizophrenia in people who are at risk, or people who have a genetic risk, as, as Josh was talking about. If they, you know, if they have a, a birth trauma, they may increase their risk for schizophrenia. If they have cannabis use in adolescence, it appears that they increase their risk for developing schizophrenia. And then lastly, where there's, we know a lot less mixed support that cannabis use not only may precipitate schizophrenia and those already at risk may have it happen earlier, there's pretty good support for that, but it, that it may actually be a component cause of ca causing a psychotic illness when it might not have otherwise occurred. So Josh showed you that with early life, er, with birth trauma. There's mixed support for that. But I want to start right now talking more about what does cannabis use do for or to people who already have schizophrenia? Um, so 
We know for many years that drug use was not a great thing uh, 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 in terms of, of uh, uh, influencing people's course of schizophrenia. The severity of the symptoms, the dis distress they had of their symptoms, the ability to, to live independently and function and, and, and really sort of go after and reach their goals in life. Uh, we knew that, that using drugs really was, 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 not a, a, was not a good thing for that, but we didn't know if that was because, gee, maybe using drugs made somebody less likely to take their medication. Or maybe it's maybe alcohol use is problematic, but other drugs aren't, or stimulants in particular that cause dopamine release are bad, and and and, uh, and other drugs aren't. But there have been a number of studies now uh, uh, that are showing that relapse rates are higher in those who continue with substance use after diagnosis, and in those who are poor, who don't take their medications uh, as they've been prescribed, and that these are independent risk factors. Okay, so, so I'll show you in the next slide. We know that continue, continued substance use and even cannabis use increases risk for relapse, even in those who really are good about taking their medicines also. Um, but, but from this study, we saw that the re risk of relapse increased more than twofold, so more than doubled in people who continue to use uh, substances after their first diagnosis. Uh, so, so again, even in the context of high high rates of medication adherence. So following up on that, in a, 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 in a, in a different study uh, out of the UK, um, we see that, that po there are poorer outcomes after first episode, specifically with cannabis use, not any kind of, just any drug abuse. So controlling for other drug use and taking your medication, so these are both associated with relapse, uh, cannabis use is associated with change in psychotic symptoms over time, so essentially worse psychotic symptoms in particular. Um, and in this study, they showed that there was a two-directional uh, uh, association. So those who had more psychotic symptoms were more likely to use more cannabis, probably seeking some sort of relief, but, but in, in, in any case, they were more likely to use cannabis. And independently, those who used more cannabis were more likely to uh, had, had worse psychotic symptoms. So this is something you can intervene in at any time, right? This is something where we can help, uh, help patients potentially do better. Um, I've got some experimental data here. This is from Cyril D'Souza at Yale, who's done a number of interesting studies. He, he like I, am very interested in, in schizophrenia and neurobiology and treatment and, and helping people really live fuller lives who have schizophrenia and in cannabis and drug use disorder. And in this study, he en enrolled people with no psychiatric illness and people with schizophrenia. And they got either a sugar pill or a very small dose of, of, of THC, which is dronabinol or marinol, it's FDA approved. People seem to not remember that we actually have, we don't need medical marijuana if we want THC. We actually have a medicine called dronabinol, so this is pharmaceutical grade THC, a, quite a small dose, and then a slightly bigger dose. These are still really quite small doses. But what they found, if you, they rated people's psychotic symptoms on the PANS, where right here is no psychotic symptoms. And this gray zone is sort of what, what Dr. D'Souza uh, uh, determined as really being uh, not clinically significant and above this blue line as being sort of clinically significant. And so if they all got placebo, they didn't see any, any change in their, in their PAN scores or their positive symptom scores. But if I got this little dose of THC, well, you see a lot of people getting a little bit of psychotic symptoms. This is controls and people with schizophrenia because you've heard of paranoia or a little bit of hallucinations with, with uh, marijuana or cannabis. And so this was seen. Um, so there's a 35% increase in in psychotic symptoms of the control group, but there's an 80% increase in the schizophrenia group, right? So they're more susceptible just in a single, after a single dose, to having an exacerbation of psychotic symptoms just in this experimental trial. And with this little bit bigger dose, same, the same finding, 40% increase in those with, uh, with, with who didn't have psychiatric illness, but a greater increase, 75% uh, increase in those with psychosis or schizophrenia. Any questions about this? Sure. Um, define substance use. Are you including alcohol, beer, wine, hard 
Yeah, so going back, uh, in this study, uh, substance use was any, any, psych any psychiatric, uh, any substance use, right? Continuing substance use increases the risk of, of relapse, okay? But um, in this study, uh, cannabis use specifically was associated with increased psychotic symptoms. This is after controlling for alcohol, cocaine, et cetera. So, so over and above, we, we know that, 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 uh, that uh, any substance use is associated with increased relapse. But that we've seen now in a couple of studies that cannabis use specifically increases your risk over and above the risk that's increased, the increased risk with alcohol or cocaine. So that's a really great point. Thanks for, um, I'm sorry. Um, so, so Dr. D'Souza went a little bit further and, and he started looking at, uh, at what are the effects of THC and what's the time course and, and can you mitigate that? And, and, and which component of, of, of cannabis might be causing this? Because cannabis, there are about 80 psychoactive compounds within marijuana. Um, and so if you think of that as, if you try to conceptualize as a medicine, well, it's really a strange thing. You're, you don't know what you're taking. You don't know the ratios. And the ratios may be quite important of the different components in cannabis that you might be taking. And this slide really shows that. So, on this side of the slide, on the left side, the three lines show placebo, two and a half milligrams of THC, and five milligrams of THC on negative symptoms. And again, placebo, two and a half milligrams, and five milligrams of THC on positive symptoms, right? So if you just take a sugar pill, nothing's happening. And you see they're not well. They actually start with a reasonable degree of psychotic symptoms here, but they get worse. And this is, this is you know, from 7 to 10. That's a clinically significant change. And then this really, I think, super important study, uh, he co-administered THC, uh, sorry, this was, this was he gave separately, THC and cannabidiol to see do these two different components of marijuana both cause psychotic symptoms. And what you see is after cannabidiol or CBD, there's nothing happening. It looks just like the sugar pill, right, over time. And with the THC, the psychotic symptoms go up. Um, and this is anxiety uh, symptoms. Again, CBD isn't bringing them down. We're not seeing an anti-anxiety effect with CBD. We're not seeing an anti-psychotic effect um, with CBD, but we're seeing no worsening. Uh, but with THC, you're seeing both psychotic symptoms and essentially distress around them increasing. So people are less comfortable following the THC. And this study, uh, he, uh, either pre-treated with cannabidiol or not. So people either got a dose, a CBD, a dose of CBD or, or a placebo first, and then they got uh, uh, THC. And what you see is when they got placebo before THC, you see an increase in psychotic symptoms within about a half an hour. But taking CBD beforehand seemed to mitigate that or protect against that. So why does this matter? Why am I keep talking about CBD and THC? Anybody know? Any, any ideas? I, I don't know, but there's something in that you just said that the answer is. I'm not quite sure. That's right. That's right. I was leading you to it. Um, well, so a lot of us think about CBD, and, and I'm sorry about that. I'm going to go ahead and give the answer. Um, I, I didn't see you before. A, a, a lot of us think, well, so you know, maybe we had experience from smoking, smoking marijuana back when we, in our youth in the 60s or 70s or 80s, uh, and, uh, and um, it you know, didn't seem so bad. So what, what's so bad about it now? And, 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 and uh, uh, well, what's different? now is the CBD has been bred out of marijuana that's available for recreational use. The THC levels have gone up five-fold in leaf marijuana, if you will, but up to sort of 50-fold in concentrated preparations of cannabis. They're very engineered products now that have taken the CBD out 
and really maximize the THC, which is the addictive component, the euphorogenic component, and what gets you high, and what makes people like it. Um, but it's taking out what potentially could have some, I think, therapeutic effects, uh, although we don't see that in schizophrenia. I'm not hopeful, unfortunately. I would love uh, for Epidiolex, which is the, the FDA-approved version of cannabidiol, which is now available, uh, I would love to see that be effective for schizophrenia, but I don't, I don't think it's going to be, um, unfortunately. Um, but so what's out there now doesn't have this protective factor in it, hardly at all. There's hardly any CBD, and until we get very good independent testing of uh, the, the products that are for sale now in Washington, Colorado, now more and more, you know, coming here, we won't know whether we've got, you know, both ingredients or really just THC, because the independent studies of, of, of cannabis on the, on the market in Colorado have shown what's on the label really doesn't show much re resemblance to what's actually in the product. So we don't have a state, a sort of a market that's regulated yet. Um, question? CBD, thank you, is cannabidiol. It's a, it's a chemical that's in pot. It's in cannabis uh, in the leaf form uh, uh, as it occurs naturally. But we've had more and more sort of genetic engineering of the plants to make them more powerful, more potent, give you a stronger high, worth more money to the seller. But it doesn't have the CBD in it. It's really maximized the amount of THC, Delta 9 THC. Yeah. In the back? Yeah, so we can maybe talk about that after the talk. The question is, have I looked at microdosing of LSD? That's a whole other, other topic, um, but, but, but quite interesting. Yeah. Um, so, so that's really, I think there's a, the biological basis just from that one, those, those several laboratory studies really make these, 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 these numbers quite plausible. So this is a super powerful study published th three years ago in psychological medicine, looking at uh, 21 years follow-up in people who, who, males who had schizophrenia, who use cannabis in their really early in their illness, okay? And they may they may have continued or not, but they definitely used in this period, you know, from 18 to 20 when they were having their first episode. And compared to males who got schizophrenia but didn't use cannabis, the, those who use cannabis had the, a longer duration of their first hospital stay, so almost twice as long, two months versus one month, the first stay. They had more hospitalizations over 21 years, an average of 10 versus four. Now we know the, the, the impact that can have on somebody's life. And not only did they have more hospitalizations, they had more days in the hospital, so those hospitalizations were likely longer. So, so 550 days versus 184. And they had a greater odds of having more than 20 hospitalizations over 21 years. Right, so, so these are dry numbers, but we all know, we can think about what that does in the course of somebody's young adulthood. This, this is hugely devastating. And, and they had greater odds of a, of a really long hospital stay, more than two years. So this is more, more than double the risk of having one of those just very long hospital stays. And <clears throat> to speak to the question that you had previously, the, these numbers are after controlling for any other sort of access to disorder, family, socioeconomic status, IQ, marital status, urban residency, which is a risk factor, and risky use of alcohol and other drug use. So again, this is a specific drug effect of cannabis over and above. So alcohol use is not good for the course of your schizophrenia either, but this is over and above that increased risk with alcohol and other drug use. So this harkens back to a slide that Josh j showed earlier, although these are, you know, we, he talked about prenatal, uh, infancy, early childhood, and it's, it's very much thought that cannabis use is potentially 
an is definitely an environmental exposure that increases risk for schizophrenia, certainly in those who are genetically predisposed, but, but there's, there's some thought that it may increase risk uh, over and above. So, so this is part of what he was talking about, a gene-environment interaction. Uh, where, where uh, you remove cannabis use from this equation, even if you do are at genetic risk for schizophrenia, you would have a reduction of, uh, of, uh, by half of your risk of, uh, of developing schizophrenia. So, so cannabis use is considered a component cause. So it's potentially a, a preventable risk factor for schizophrenia. And so there's really thought that prevention, early identification, and treatment of cannabis use may delay the onset of a psychotic illness in those at high risk, okay? Because the earlier the onset is, the worse the course is for schizophrenia. So even delaying onset may have some impact. So we think that it's really important, and so I bolded these, that reducing exposure at critical risks really could reduce incidence and severity and potentially delay onset of psychosis uh, an improved course of schizophrenia. And so in our first episode program and, and around the country, we certainly speak to, to family members where there's a younger sibling and, and let them know, please intervene. Please don't let this early sibling, younger sibling of somebody with the first episode use cannabis. Um, this is a data slide showing risk of schizophrenia, developing schizophrenia, uh, really by dose of exposure. And this graph is, is, is a compilation of all of these studies uh, in which the, the, essentially the dose, which is potency and frequency, as it goes up in a sort of standardized measure, the risk of schizophrenia goes up, and in some studies more than others. So this is almost twofold, and this is over sevenfold. Um, and this is a, a nice study showing that the risk of psychosis really doesn't bump up until um, they're smoking high potency uh, THC. And this is the, th this is the kind of, of, of cannabis that really doesn't have CBD in it, and it has high potency THC. So that's where, if you're, you're smoking, and, the, and the, the nickname for it in the UK or in South London is skunk. So they're smoking skunk. I guess it's smelly. But, uh, but you see that the risk goes up, particularly in the, where you, this is all never used. For, this is essentially leaf or you know, flower. This is hash. And then this is skunk. So the risk goes up twofold, almost threefold, and over fivefold when you do it less than once a week at the weekends and every day. So there's a place to s potentially intervene. And you know, I mentioned uh, age of onset, and this is from that same group who's been very interested in sort of potency. So hash is the low potency, and skunk is the high potency. And this stair step is age of onset. So the kids that are using skunk every day, the ones who develop schizophrenia, they develop at age 25. Those who are using it less often develop at 26. Those who don't smoke the skunk but use the hash develop it at 29. Those who use hash less often at 31. And that's no different from never using. In fact, the hash at all is no different from ever using statistically. So staying away from high potency THC that's so going to be so much more available with, uh, with a commercial market and commercial products uh, for, for cannabis is going to be so important because these products are engineered and they're quite uh, potent. So this is my last slide, which is another really good news slide, and I'll walk you through it. Uh, what this is saying is quitting cannabis after first episode significantly reduces the risk of relapse. And, and, and so this is essentially three separate uh, analyses. And if the, if the arrow falls on this side, it means you've got an increased risk of relapse. And if it falls on this side, you have a lower risk of relapse. And up here, you see an increased risk of relapse when you compare continued use versus never using. So people who, after first episode, continue using have an, an increased risk of psychosis. Um, compared to never users. So 
continued use versus discontinued use. So, so those who keep using have a higher risk for relapse compared to those who were using it first episode but stopped. So quitting you know, at, after first episode can reduce your risk of relapse, even to the point where there's no difference. See, this, this diamond is lined up right on the dotted line. That means there's absolutely there's no difference in those who quit using after first episode versus those who never used. So it's a get out of jail free card. Right, so, so, so we need more studies like this, but this is actionable intelligence, as we would say, to go back to our security, uh, security thing uh, earlier. So this is something that people can do to improve, essentially, their course even after a first episode. And so, you know, th the, the environment out there is changing. Um, it's changed in parts of the country, and it's really gonna change for, for us with the opening of the, um, of pot shops. Um, I can go on now Weed Maps, which is an app for your phone, and shop you know, in the town next to me for what kind of chocolate I want with high THC or what kind of Nutella I want with high THC. So this, is, this isn't just coming, it's actually here. Um, so I think it makes this just all the more important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eden. I have to admire you here. The ship is going down, nothing works, but you just, uh, you know, very coolly <laughs> managed this. <laughs> Always a model for me. Uh, we're going to stick a little bit maybe with the various preparations and those, those, those effects. Um, and, and how can you reduce your risk? So what if, if you happen to have smoked heavily during adolescence and then you would it make a difference for your risk to develop schizophrenia if you stop, perhaps in time? Or is this something that you know, if you do it at some point in time, even stopping might not make a difference anymore. Yeah, I, I wish we knew. We, we know the increased risk for schizophrenia uh, with, uh, with, with prior use from great big studies of, you know, everybody who joined the army in Sweden where it's required, you know, over a several year period, population in New Zealand, uh, two different studies, you know. Uh, so, so we don't have that kind of fine-grained information. Uh, uh, but I think, you know, you do what you can, and, and uh, this, I think, uh, says that t to me that, that, uh, that quitting uh, after first episode certainly reduces risk of relapse, uh, so it's a good thing to try to do, to reduce your exposure to THC. Uh, thank you. Somebody said, get this information to psychiatrists, which I'm going to read. Uh, after seven hospitalizations for our now 24-year-old son with uh, frequent cannabis use in adolescence, he has now not been psychotic for 10 months with my insistence on zero pot. And, you know, the idea that it actually does matter, it's not just, you know, because it's legal, uh, particularly for people, you know, with, with illnesses and, 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 and problems, and that perhaps psychiatrists should be thoughtful about it, including drug testing. Um, yeah. I'm just going to jump in there. Canada has a wonderful program. It's called Legal Not Safe, which I think really counters that message that legalization means it's okay. It's actually, it's good. You know, it's a medicine. Um, it, uh, so, so I think that's a nice little catchphrase, legal not safe. Um, you know, tobacco's legal, and that's the only consumer product to kill half its users you know, when used as directed. So we're not, we don't have a great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were quite a few questions, and maybe you can elaborate on your last point of bringing up kind of the, do, do our lawmakers actually know this? And, you know, how did we end up with the situation here in the Commonwealth that it sounds somewhat unregulated in terms of, you know, how much we can actually, how much THC is actually allowed, you know? Right. Um, that's a whole. That's it's a great question. It's a whole talk in and of itself. That there, we know how to regulate uh, things to minimize impact on public health. Uh, uh, we know, and we're not doing it. Uh, so, 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 and that's because public health, you know, is on one side, and and the way it's been conceptualized, essentially, profit or income is on the other. 
Uh, and so people do stand to make, corporations do stand to make an enormous uh, amount of money uh, selling a, a, an addictive drug that, that does cause harm to, to, to many people. And for many people, it doesn't cause harm, right? So for adults who use occasionally and don't drive while they're using it, there's no evidence that there's, that there's major harm. But for some people, particularly kids, people with psychotic illnesses, uh, uh, the, 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 the risk is quite high. Um, and I'll just say that, that our Cannabis Control Commission, uh, they're politically appointed folks. Uh, Sharon Levy is the only physician on, on, she's a pediatrician from Children's. She wasn't even appointed to a committee, so she volunteered for the Public Health uh, Committee. Um, uh, and by statute, the law we voted for has uh, public health people outnumbered on the Cannabis Control Commission. The most you can have is five out of a 12-member panel. Um, and we're just not doing things like potency limits, like plain packaging, like warning labels, like not selling liquor and pot right next to each other because combination of alcohol and cannabis is, is, is worse than either alone at uh, the same dose uh, for, for driving, but also probably for impact on cognition. So th there's a lot we could be doing. We know from tobacco and alcohol some things to do to regulate an industry, and we're just not doing it. Can you see efforts actually in the school system that we are addressing this? Like, you know, I have kids in school. They, uh, you know, get exposed to a lot of uh, information about alcohol and all kinds of other things. Are they learning this? Yeah, so th they've learned, they've really learned about cigarettes because we've, we've spent a huge amount of money. Cigarettes are not cool. Um, but vaping is cool now, um, and you can vape your THC oil. Um, uh, uh, but we are actually in the schools. Um, we 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 were we're in now three schools where we go in and we we uh, we 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 enroll people who don't use cannabis and people who do. And the ones who do, we flip a coin and they either we pay them to stop for a month or they just do, you know, we don't pay them to stop and they usually continue using marijuana. But we wanted to see their ability to learn. Uh, did it get better? And lo and behold, we were all over the news last week on Tuesday and Wednesday. You can Google uh, uh, cannabis memory. And, uh, you know, we were in Newsweek and Reuters and the Canadian broadcast system. We were in The Guardian. Um, showing that improved ability to learn in kids just after a month of abstinence. And these were not heavy using kids. These used uh, uh, once a week, uh, 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 at least once a week. So most of them only used, say, on a Saturday. And they and their parents thought they'd be fine for their trig test on Wednesday. And what we found is, no, they're, the one job of a, of a high school student is to learn. Right, uh, that's their main job, and they're un unable to do that to their potential if they're using weed, as they call it, e even weekly. Yeah, so there were quite a few questions about this. This, uh, I guess, what do you get away with a little bit? You know, as a chronic use or during a critical period, okay, that seems to really increase. Your, what about this kind of somewhat whatever rare means to people? You know, maybe once a week. Uh, just really low grade use, uh, does it protect you from if you have genetic risk or how do you see it? So, so any use of high potency THC seems to increase your risk. So even at the weekends or less, you saw that there's increased risk and stopping use reduces risk. And interestingly, if you look at the dates, the, 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 for some of these, the effect gets bigger as, as, as we get later dates, um, and that's probably because in the environment there's higher potency THC. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, talk about high potency uh, stuff. What about K2? Huh. So K2 and spice are even worse. Th these, are, these are synthetic uh, THC. We don't see them a lot here. Uh, there are a lot in, in, in um, Don sees it a lot in New York, uh, in Bellevue. Um, so, so these are har uh, hard to detect, uh, and they actually have a worse effect on psychotic symptoms, as far as we can tell anecdotally. Yeah. Yeah, we actually uh, see them in disadvantaged populations yeah. in Massachusetts, like people who are homeless uh, in, in shelters. So it is a problem here as, as well. But it is true; it's not a problem. You know, the high school students, I think they. They, what do they, they vape, the uh, oil? There's synthetic benzos is, is rampant in the high schools now. Good to know. Uh, many questions about uh, CBD as a treatment. Um, uh, so there seem to be studies though that show that 
given CBD to patients with psychosis might alleviate symptoms or, or not? So the clinical trials have failed. So it didn't do as well as amisulpiride in a European trial. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, I mean, I would love to see a medication particularly improve negative symptoms because there's not a lot. We don't have a lot for that. But, uh, but the trial failed. And there are a lot of reasons a trial can fail. We, you know, it'll probably be used again. It'll probably be tried again now that there's an FDA-approved uh, uh, source for, ca for cannabidiol, which is Epidiolex, which was studied right here at MGH for pediatric seizures, intractable seizures. So the pioneering work was done here, and I'm sure it'll be studied again. Um, I'd love to see it if, if it worked, but I, I, right now there's, there's not evidence to support it. I would not go out and get it for myself or my family member uh, uh, at this point. Well, you made a very clear statement about what quite a few people ask, you know, what about the FDA approved CBD and where can you get it and what is it used for and shouldn't we just use it um, on, on our own, basically. <laughs> uh, are there support groups, including at MGH, you know, if you have problems with uh, schizophrenia but also uh, cannabis use, kind of this idea of dual diagnosis treatment? Uh, yeah, it's particularly for young people, the ARMS program, uh, uh, that's a place where, where both parents of, 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 of youth under the age of 25 uh, and youth can get uh, support for, uh, for uh, both a psych, you know, psychotic illness combined with a substance use uh, issue like cannabis. Uh, I think an important question, uh, we are talking about schizophrenia here, but are some of these associations that we see or cannabis being a risk, is, does this apply to, to other disorders like bipolar disorder, other serious mental illness? Yeah, so we, we know less about that. That's a great question. Uh, but, but I think any illness that makes you prone to psychosis is not, it's not going to be uh, a, a, a good thing to be using cannabis. And, and I'm just frank with folks. I, I see a fair number of p kids who are coming through the pediatric bipolar program. And, you know, Janet or somebody sends them over to talk to me about their alcohol use or their cannabis use. And, and I just say, like, you know, they're, they're in high school. And I say, you know, this is not fair because your friends are experimenting uh, with drugs or alcohol but you just can't afford to. Um, so, so we know that, that people with bipolar disorder who use, um, use substances have a vastly increased risk of developing a substance use disorder. So, you know, so, so, you know, 50%. Uh, whereas uh, we, we don't know its effect on, on, say, their psychotic symptoms, but they certainly have an increased risk for addiction. And, and I just don't, certainly don't know of, of any evidence that there's any protective effect. Now, there are some countries like, like the Netherlands where, you know, cannabis has been legal for quite a while. Are they actually seeing higher rates of schizophrenia? Yeah. So that's a, really a common question, and, but no other country has rolled out cannabis the way we are with high potency, com, you know, commercially engineered. I mean, you know, it, it, it's in soda, it's in ice cream, it's in lollipops, it's in baked goods. Uh, it's in high potency vapable waxes, like 95% THC. So uh, we are the first experiment with uh, essentially a full on commercial market with advertising, et cetera. I mean, the Netherlands tolerates it grudgingly. They've made it legal, which I'm in favor. I, I think marijuana should not be, a, a, it shouldn't be a criminal offense to possess marijuana. I'm not in favor of putting people in prison for, for having marijuana. I, absolutely not. But, uh, but uh, one of the public health strategies is to legalize, but to essentially grudgingly tolerate. And that's what happens in the Netherlands. Uh, it's, it's, there's, there's places for people to go and use. So they're off the streets, and, uh, uh, but it's not a Wild West freewheeling for profit industry, uh, which is what, what, we, what we're getting. So la last question, you know, it's an industry, so there's a lot of products out there. Is there one product to be safe, you know, that you should uh, maybe preferentially use? Is it smoking or should you just a little bit of a cookie or something? Does it make a difference? I'm sorry, should I start over? <laughs> I think it would be nice to re-emphasize your main point. Nothing. Um, uh, uh, I think it's a bad. It's 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 a, it's problematic. It it really causes long-term. I think significant impacts on the lives of people uh, who use 
who use cannabis and, and have, uh, have, have uh, either risk for or have a psychotic illness. Um, I will say to be particularly careful about edibles. Um, they're a growing part of the market. Um, <clears throat> And yeah, they look, you know, ice cream, cookies, uh, soda, Nutella, chocolate. Um, but it's, they, it's very hard to titrate your dose with these things. And, the, and often, and we're, we're getting this. So, so the Cannabis Control Commission is going to allow, I think, pies, whole pies, where on the box, the serving size is drawn, like, you know, in marker or whatever, you know, that, that you take this much. And, you know, in, 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 in California, with, for a decade, for, with a medical marijuana card, you can buy Nutella, which is 320 milligrams of THC per cup. And the uh, serving size is a teaspoon, level teaspoon. And I don't know how you eat Nutella, but, I, you know, I use a bigger spoon than that. So, so I think the edibles are, are because they're sweet, they appeal to youth, and the dosing, uh, that's what I'd, I'd, I'd caution folks to, about the most. And it's something that, that, uh, that somebody who's n never used before might be more likely to, to say, oh, you know, uh, try it. But um, you can have a very delayed onset uh, uh, of, of a high that, that's not going to go away for a while and might be quite uncomfortable. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a 60-minute lunch break and uh, reconvene here at uh, 12.45, please.